But I want to start off with um, telling you a little story. So, story time. Um, <laughs> uh, but as I tell the story, I'm going to go through a couple of slides. So I'll just throw up there. They're not terribly important, but you'll, you'll understand what I mean. They're, they're, some of them are silly photos. But it just kind of gives you an idea of my background and my school background. Uh, image on the wall right now is that is of our school, our building. Obviously not during the school year because it's impeccable right there. Um, at University of Toronto, uh, the Landscape Architecture Department. And um, it was originally a dentistry uh, a school uh, for U of T. And you can see a little black and white image someone's holding up there. But that it converted and, and became the school of architecture and landscape architecture. Um, so I want to tell you the story, and uh, this is a story of how I first met Dan Kiley. So I call this the interview because this was my first interview to get my job working for him. Um, so around the spring of my graduating year of 97, I was frantically planning out my future. Earlier that year, the legendary Dan Kiley came to our school to lecture. I thought, why not? What do I have to lose? The only question was how big of a bribe did I have to offer the school's administrative assistant to get hold of Dan's mailing address. As it turned out, I only had to ask. She was, and I'm not sure if she should have been, um, that's why she shall remain nameless, eager to help, and gladly handed me Dan's contact information. So for the coming weeks, I labored over my cover letter, reworked my resume over and over, and took photos of my favorite projects. Back in those days, uh, there was no such thing as digital cameras. So I solicited some professional help from our school's uh, official photographer and got some decent shots of my drawings uh, onto slides and such. And for almost two months, uh, I submitted my work, but uh, for almost uh, two months, I uh, heard nothing back, and I thought it was over, lost cause. He's not going to bother with me, an undergraduate from Canada. Weeks before the end of the last year, we were all working, sleeping, living in the school studio, trying to finish off our final project. Our studio became a cozy makeshift home with couch, rug, and pets. Someone was always in the studio, which had a phone. One day, a friend of mine came to me as I stepped into the studio and said, Some Dan Kiley called for you. I'm sure he knew who Dan Kiley was, but even as he said those words, I don't think he realized whom he was actually talking about. He was probably just too tired to put one and one together. Since we've been all working hard to survive our last year, after a few hours of calming down and probably a beer or two, um, I worked up the, college, the, the courage to call Dan back. He was very cordial and happy to hear from me. He said he wanted me to come to his office for an interview. Without blinking, I said yes. Of course, to get to Burlington, Vermont from Toronto is not exactly an easy thing to pull off. As soon as a soon-to-be graduate, I don't have much money to throw around. Flying was out of the question. Driving was the only possibility. It was a seven-hour drive through southern Ontario, across upper New York, and then down to Burlington. A drive I will soon be able to do blindfolded. My then girlfriend, today wife, accompanied me, accompanied, uh, me with this driving adventure. I brought everything all of my favorite projects and binders full of photos and models and other things I could not pack into my little Pontiac Firefly, which, by the way, you might not even understand this reference. It's uh, equivalent to Geo Metro in US, but both of which are all discontinued. So you're not going to use it. It's a car. But it was a great car. As we all know, Dan's house was, uh, as, we, as I know, <laughs> uh, Dan's house was on a farm referred to as East Farm, Charlotte, on the mailing address. As you drive up close, I found it was even less obvious to locate. I even remember that I had passed this driveway the first time. The road ended on another farm, which happened to have two friendly border, border colleagues to meet us. 
a nice lady came up to us and told us we had passed Dan's driveway. On my second try, I pulled into this narrow roadway which had no sign, no indication of even a home beyond the scrubby hedge. The narrow road turned quickly and then I noticed an evenly spaced single row of maple trees on one side. I said to my girlfriend, this is it. She gave me a curious look. As I drove closer to the house, the driveway ended in a gravel square which was bordered by a few sheds and a carport with a tractor, a green Jeep Cherokee, which I will drive, Dan, all around New York and Connecticut, and another car undercover, which was what I will soon find out was Dan's beloved M.G. Morgan. As I stepped into the large barn house, it was seemingly quiet and empty. I think it was a Saturday. I can't totally remember. <laughs> I stepped in and the floor creaked. I said, hello? More creaks from the floors above and the man bellowed. Is that you, Terrence? Come on up. <laughs> See, he was really bad of hearing and he never wore hearing aids, so we had to yell a lot. I had all my things with me, rolls and rolls of drawings and binders and paper. My girlfriend was helping me. We walked up the steeply proportioned three flights of stairs to the top floor. There was a small room to the right and then a big room to the left. He said excitedly, come in, come in, to us both. I started to say awkwardly, um, she's just helping me. She was, she, she can wait. And then Dan cut me off and invited my girlfriend in to sit in on our, my interview. We talked about everything, from my background of where I was born, to my schooling in Toronto, and my last summer with EDAW as part of the summer student program. It was not until I got to my projects and started to roll out my drawings that I realized the obvious. He loved to talk and hear about projects. Whether it's my student projects or his many decades worth of work and all the stories that came with it, the most satisfying part of the interview came when I realized how excited he was of some design work I was doing. For the past year, I had been doing research on Dan, partly for school and partly for personal interests. Like all admirers, I was blown away by how he blended formal French gardens with modernism to create some of the most beautiful, innovative, and modern gardens with architects like Saarinen, I.M. Pei, Kevin Roche, <coughs> to name a few. My school project work began to emulate some of the formalism that I found in Dan's work. For one of my projects, I had proposed this orchard parking lot design. I remember I was totally railed by all the guest critics at the final review. But when Dan saw this, he was delighted. So that was the ultimate vindication. I landed the job, and for the next two and a half years, it was a dream come true. I met a lot of great and interesting people along the way, like Dan's old friend, Leonard Unger, U.S. Ambassador to China during the Nixon years, in D.C. Um, to Santiago Calatrava, who loved America. Calatrava is the architect of um, a lot of works um, in, in, in Europe, but uh, here as well. And he's also architect of the uh, transit hub at the uh, 9-11 Memorial. Um, so to Sandia Calatrava, who loved American food so much, we laughed at each other's ridiculously Flintstone-like proportion dinners in Milwaukee. There were huge steaks. It was enormous. So you have to that was Milwaukee. Flintstone. Oh, dear. So Flintstone is this cartoon of kind of caveman uh, ears and you know there's, there's all the food and things just kind of extra huge size so it's kind of funny that way but this was literally what was on my plate I had this big rack of you know ribs that was like falling off the edge of the plate so anyways um, Santiago was really funny about that he that that little you know steak shop was just like outside suburban Milwaukee and that was his favorite place to go <laughs> And Peter Rose, who, whose meticulously designed houses caused endless redesign from Dan, only to match the greatness of his ideas. I also owe great thanks to the hospitality of the Kylies for inviting me to endless family dinners and events 
it was and will probably remain to be my greatest experience of all time. The simple truth I learned, Dan truly loved his work, and out of his love came the genius of his impeccable sense of space, scale, light, and materials. My grandfather also passed away during the summer of 97. Instead of going to Hong Kong to be part of my family's reunion of sorts, uh, even my mother knew how important this job was and insisted I go to Vermont instead. In an odd way, I have always saw Dan as my distant grandfather. All the yelling because he insisted not wearing a hearing aid, funny gestures to elicit spatial definite characteristics. He, he had these, all these hand signals. Um, and you're supposed to be able to understand what it means. And, um, and just the endless reference to skiing nuances as lessons in life was only a few perks of working at ODK. He never used ODK, but we did internally, so that's the office of Dan Kiley. So for my little departure gift, I had a book, and this is what he signed for me. Unfortunately, that's the only image I have <laughs> of myself in the studio, which was in this um, barn house, farmhouse, that his kids, his nine kids, grew up in. Um, and of course, the house was all empty. Um, he had the big room, like I mentioned, at the top floor. So we're supposed to rise, walk up the steps to the master every <laughs> time, wherever we needed to talk to him. And the studio was at the basement level. Yeah. And we had a little reunion uh, not too long ago. Uh, the ASLA conference was in Boston about two years ago. And that's Peter uh, Meyer and Jane Amidon. Uh, when we saw each other at this uh, special exhibit that the TCL left, uh, Center for Landscape Foundation, I think. Anyways, it's a, it's a group that put together this uh, special exhibit uh, on Dan's work. So we had a nice little reunion there. I think the first time since I left, which is you know, 12, 15 years ago. So my first project, let's get to the project. So my first project for Dan, essentially the project I was hired to do, was this. Uh, MID, Matsushita Industrial Development, uh, that's a developer in Kyoto, Japan. This is the Kyoto train station in the center. And, um, and our project site was this. This is obviously a curtain, <laughs> a Google uh, view of, of it. Uh, unfortunately, the project was never built, and they built this gigantic uh, shopping mall. Um, but what we had was pretty interesting. It was a uh, project where uh, we had five different architects. Um, Harry Cobb did the main, um, uh, Cobb Payfree did the main uh, office building here. And uh, KPF did a, a theater project. Uh, I think Nikan Seke had a hotel. And uh, Italian architect um, Mario Bellini did another um, building over here. And as you can guess, uh, we had the dream job of doing the landscape for the entire development. So that's under the building, across you know, all, this, all these different spaces. So we're exploring all kinds of different um, uh, ways of creating this pattern that can you know, run through the, the ground uh, across all the buildings. Um, and with different uh, gardens and fountains, there's all kinds of things going on. This is like the ultimate dream garden. <laughs> and as you, as young practitioners, you will understand and realize that you know your biggest uh, uh, asset is you are probably the most familiar with your uh, technology. Um, so in terms of computer use, in terms of 3D modeling. You know, that's obviously going to be very important. It is important for, it, for the offices and people out there and employing because um, uh, I started out that way in, in a way too because I was the first one who brought some computer use uh, into Dan's office. So I did the simple, very simple uh, wireframe modeling uh, just to show um, these uh, different spacings of uh, trees that Dan wanted. Uh, Dan always designed with you know, wanting to see what the space feel like when you're in it. 
um, very seldom. Like he'll 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 of course he's interested in the plan and stuff, but he's always to me he's always looking. Uh, he's always asking me, "What do I see? What was the site look like? What do I see if I'm standing here or versus there?" So I had to do these kinds of drawings over and over, and he would want to see like you know tr different tree spacing, you know, 15 feet to 18 to 20, all these different scenarios. So this was a nice way of doing it. So this is what I used to always do for him over and over. Um, have these quick wireframes and with a sketch over top to show the trees, the spacing, a couple of lines on the ground plane that he wanted that, that, um, that would uh, kind of indicate what the space is starting to feel like. So you can see that big uh, building is over here where you know, these huge columns that come down. They're, I think, actually elevate, elevator cores that come down and you rise up to the building. So the garden, all the trees kind of run underneath this. And, and more of that. So some events going on. There's a big uh, water feature. You, I, I know you can barely see it, but it's there. <laughs> and, and some uh, uh, kiosk things happening. Um, so more of the same. This is looking uh, a different direction towards the hotel, I believe. That's the Nikon Seke Hotel beyond. And this is looking back again. This, there's the big building. So try to, again, get, get the feeling of what it's like uh, in the space. And after that, one of the projects I worked on was this competition at Columbus Circle. This is way back in probably 98. And we were invited. Uh, so we're uh, lots of other people, but <laughs> as you will probably, so Columbus Circle, in case you don't know, whoever is not familiar with New York, is the southwest corner of uh, Central Park. Uh, that's Central Park right here. And uh, that's, that's in there, is the Columbus Circle. And we came up with a scheme that is essentially what uh, ended up built by Olin. Uh, partners um, minus the trees because Dan really wanted to flood it and, and create this kind of forest within a traffic circle which you think about is it, kind of impossible but that's what he wanted um, but if you take a closer look the access points the three access points the trees and we're the, the fact that we're trying to create this feeling of a buffer zone that's exactly what's out there today but this is just a very very early version of it and you can see some of the, you know, I'm playing with some of the computer stuff, modeling too, uh, getting uh, different ideas. Uh, and Dan was very open to that idea, very excited about seeing these uh, 3D models uh, done quickly. And then we worked on a lot of residential projects, um, but I wouldn't really call them residential, they're more like estates. They're like thousands and thousands of acres. <laughs> Uh, for very, very prominent families of uh, New York and Connecticut, uh, with the exception of this. And this is the project I'm really proud of because I worked on it a lot. Uh, I did the model, the actual physical model of it as well, uh, besides all of the drawings. And it's a small little place in New Jersey, and I'm very uh, upset at myself not knowing exactly where this is located now, but I just know it's very close to Newark Airport because I remember driving it, driving out there into <laughs> the site. But we had a uh, um, kind of a, a, a creek uh, down here. Uh, that's why the, the grading is dropping down. And uh, we wanted the driveway, a very formal driveway that comes in into this house. I don't remember who the architect was. It wasn't a very um, good architect, actually. Um, and so this is one of those uh, rare projects that I got to work on from beginning all the way through the end to CDs and to you know, construction and to, to go out to uh, tag trees and all that. So that was very special for me. Um, so you can see some of the minimal formalism coming in. And he loved that, that the simple square uh, court uh, for cars to come in, park, and turn around. Uh, it's very elegant and grating, of course. Uh, mind you, these drawings are all hand on ink on mylar. Ink on mylar. 
Do we still know what Mylar is? Yeah, I don't know yeah. if you guys know what Mylar is. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great material, I have to say. Uh -huh. um, so this is not a really exciting project that I got to work on a lot from the beginning of the project. This is Pittsburgh. Uh, for you uh, who's not familiar, there's the stadium. Uh, it's very new, but this is Allegheny. And uh, there's, there's a group called Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, and they did a lot of projects to improve the public lands in Pittsburgh uh, in the late 90s. There's a very famous uh, Michael Van Valkenburg project that's along here, along the riverfront. Um, that's right around here. And uh, we were, Dan was uh, asked to come in to design this little plaza right here. And it's next to a theater that was just finishing up that Michael Graves uh, did. So it's a very simple um, urban plaza, uh, but we did have one strange uh, issue to contend with, was, which was the sculpture. Um, the artist was uh, Louise Bourgeois. Uh, Louise had a piece actually here in San Francisco just a few years ago. Do you remember the big giant spider that was yeah. on the Embarcadero? That's her. Um, I can't imagine what her age is, but she's getting up there. Uh, but this was an interesting piece. Uh, this is, uh, when you see it, it's, it's obviously uh, predates the, the slick uh, chrome looking spiders. Uh, this is a very different uh, time period, I guess. Um, and then again, you know, these drawings were all done ink on Myler, um, full CD set. Is this a sepia? I mean, is a sepia well, print? No. Uh, it's, it's, what is a sepia print? Yeah, that's, that's actually Dan's, one of the things that he loved uh, a lot is so whenever we made prints for final renderings, he, he, we have this, uh, this is our secret weapon. It's like, uh, it's a sepia colored uh, blueprint uh, um, machine, basically. Well, machine, but the paper is sepia. So when you run it, it instead of coming blue, being blueprint, this is, it comes out light brown like this. So you just got that old classic look about it. I mean, we didn't use that paper for the actual CDs, but when you do a color rendering, it's very nice because it's a, you just slow a little bit of color on it, and it's it really uh, finish it finish it up. So that's the funky uh, sculpture thing. I I could barely explain it. I I can explain it, but I don't know. I still to this day not understand it. <laughs> So these are the, all these different levels, and the water kind of overflow. It just fall, 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 and, and gets down to the, the bottom. And it's bordered by these uh, uh, bollarded uh, uh, London planes, I believe. So I have to apologize for this image. It looks fine on my screen, but obviously not on here. So again, um, I was doing uh, uh, some 3D modeling to get my perspective views to get this drawing out quickly. So you can see how that comes to life when you, you know, instead of columns, they become trunks. Uh, uh, in empty spaces, you put people in them, and then all of a sudden it's lively, and, and you can see what's going on. So would you do these drawings and then present them to Dan, and he would okay them? I mean, how far yeah. would you go before you had to say, well, all those drawings probably had a black and white version at one point uh, on trays, and then he'll look at them, he'll, he'll OK it, and then I'll run it and do all the coloring. And then him and probably someone else <laughs> more senior would go to the client, travel to Pittsburgh, and get it approved, and then that's it. Yeah. So he always yeah. had some say in all of the work that he Oh, yes. Of, yes. Yes. Okay. No, at the time when I was there and when I, when I started working for him, he was 85. And, and it was a studio of four, including him. Uh, so it's very small, tight knit, so it's no problem for him to basically constantly looking over my shoulder whether I like it or not. <laughs> um, and he was right there uh, watching it. So yeah, it was, it was good, it was great. Um, he was very, very involved with uh, everything. So this is some of the site photos uh, I found. Unfortunately, I still never been there myself to see it uh, in person. But uh, hopefully, you can tell that it's 
resembles pretty well to the drawings and sections that we had for it. So it's festive. Uh, one of the last projects that I worked on uh, while working for Dan was this. Uh, I mentioned earlier in Milwaukee. Um, uh, this is the Calatrava uh, Art Museum expansion of uh, Milwaukee Art uh, Museum. And, and at the time, this was the first uh, Santiago uh, Calatrava building in the U.S. Uh, of course, now is well, it's still the first, but it's not the only. At the time, it was the only uh, building. And, um, and it was uh, a lot of fun uh, uh, to work on and to meet uh, someone like Santiago and to actually see them interact, uh, kind of two masters in, in their own right. Um, I remember our kickoff meeting um, was just the two of them talking. <laughs> I remember seeing the agenda and I just laughed at the agenda because there was no way we were going to stick to their schedule because the two of them just talked and talked and everyone listened. So it's almost like watching a, a little lecture all day. And then, of course, we had that steak in there for dinner. <laughs> um, so this was a um, very interesting, very different uh, design for Dan because it's, 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 it does have the sense of formalism, a very large big moves, um, but he really wanted to react to something about uh, Kyle Travis' architecture, and he did it in his kind of own way. Um, so I remember this is a term that he came up with. It's a harmonic contrapuntal gesture uh, of, uh, of, of Kyle Travis' work because of how he, you know, these, those are, the, the longitude is a um, 800 foot long water wall that goes the entire length and then crossing it are hedges and paths that you can get across and through the wall uh, without getting wet but uh, you can go through them um, and that sort of rip like looking uh, thing is uh, further uh, there's there's a grade change here so that is like a high point and it slopes down so you can so it reveals that there's a retaining wall along this almost what feels like a, a bridge uh, crossing to get you to the museum. So again, these are my drawings uh, trying to give you the sense of the feel for that space. Those, that's the hedge there, so that's the water wall, the top of it at least. And, um, very transparent in my rendering here. <laughs> Actually, I think this is the one. Yeah, that's, that's the top of the water. Uh, so you see the base of the building through the water like that. At least that was the idea. And then, of course, bridges uh, connect to a, a major parking lot on the other side that takes you straight to the uh, museum. So if you're ever in Milwaukee, stop by. I heard that recently there's another project that just opened up and I believe uh, field operations uh, have won this piece to redo this whole marina uh, out, out front here. But this would all uh, stay intact. So here's our, some site photos I found. Uh, looks like they got the height correct. So let's just talk about water feature designers for a second. Uh, there's a name that you should all be familiar with, Dan User. He's a really wonderful uh, uh, fountain designer from Toronto. He's designed pretty much every major fountain by any major landscape architect. So this is one of them. He also designed the uh, waterfalls at the 9-11 memorial uh, piece. and and a couple of things in Toronto and Sydney Olympics for Hargraves uh, and on and on. And after Dan, uh, I, I was with Dan for about two and a half years and then you know, when people ask me, I just have to say, well, what happened, I would say life happened. And, and 
my fiance at the time um, had a job offer out here in the Bay Area, so we moved out here. And when I first came out of California, I uh, started working for George Hargraves. Uh, and this was one of my first projects, uh, the Guadalupe River, Guadalupe River Park. It's a really interesting project if you guys are not familiar with it. It's, uh, it's, it's along the river and it's uh, originally a U.S. Army Corps project. Uh, and it's all about trying to deal and handle the uh, river so that it does not, because it used to flood the downtown San Jose all the time. And uh, so there's all these uh, different plans about widening or concreting. Kind of your worst case scenario, like LA River, you just kind of concrete the thing and just kind of divert the water out of downtown. But instead, George and others had convinced the core to develop much more landscape approach. Uh, we created uh, spaces that people can use, planted it. Uh, that's why you can't even see much of it because it's all kind of covered, it's in here. Uh, and then continues a couple of blocks down. And what I worked on was actually the very last piece, the very last phase uh, of that project. And as, oh yeah, so back to kind of the career track conversation. Um, so after you know, being, I thought I was being all savvy and bringing computer to Kylie office, you know, Little did I know that I really don't know much about computers <laughs> because until I got the hard grades, that's when I really started to have to learn CAD um, uh, kind of on the job. So again, you know, learning on the job. Um, I had to learn quickly. Uh, it's sort of sink or swim. So this was some of my work. I think that was a planting plan for it. So it, this is you know, my first real kind of uh, exposure to CAD and how a normal, I say normal only because you know, Dan's uh, so well known in his own way. You know, he's always used to doing his, everything his way. Um, so there was a total freedom. But now, <laughs> to the real world, we had to answer the clients and the site issues and all that. And, uh, and you know, it was, it was a huge education for me. It's a really interesting site because much of it is under all these uh, off ramps. Um, and, uh, and it's actually pretty nice, pretty quiet down there. Uh, I believe these were all alders in uh, DG. And then we did have a little kind of uh, plaza space out here with some stone, quartzite stone. The quartzite to match a lot of the quartzite that were used other parts of uh, Guadalupe River Park, uh, GRP for short, that's what we all called it. Um, but as with all these kind of long-term, multi-year, this, this is probably on the 10th year by, by the point that I got involved. Uh, uh, the budget is all depleted, so it's very, very low budget. And hence, we're stuck with this. <laughs> you can see all of the walls became just concrete. Um, and and no 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 fancy uh, edging material, whatnot. Uh, other parts of GRP were all were all stone. They, like the concrete would have been the the, the backing, and the, if they're all stone fascia, uh, a nice quartzite. But we couldn't afford it anymore, so this was the next best thing. But these photos these photos were taken probably you know probably close to 10 years ago, so I can't imagine. I haven't been out there in a while, but I'm sure it's, you know, kind of much, yeah, wilder than this. You probably can't even see the ground anymore. Uh, one of the projects I also worked on was the West Bluff at the Christie Field. West Bluff meaning like the very west end of Christie Field up against this embankment at the Golden Gate. Uh, we worked on this area. Um, I didn't, Chrissy feels a, another pretty uh, multi-year uh, long-term project and by the time I got involved I was only working with the kind of the construction portions of it and one of the uh, uh, stories <laughs> that come with us was that when, when the time for construction came along um, the contractors realized the survey was wrong 
and, 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 the, and the bluff was actually 20 feet closer to the park than originally thought. So we had a lot less space. So this one giant berm used to be two berms. We used to have two kind of uh, slip and slide sort of diverging berm uh, scenario. Uh, so that you never have direct access into a park. You have to kind of walk around the berm. That was our, our idea. Uh, so we ran out of space, we couldn't do it anymore, so we, we just had to uh, uh, keep this because we wanted to keep everything else the way it was looking with the uh, amphitheater and, and the gardens. So I took my class out uh, a few weeks ago, walked around here, checked it out. Um, of course it's a beautiful site, but you know, it is worth taking the note that uh, it has weathered uh, and not well. All the mounds uh, are all kind of rounded out and it's all flattened. The, the grass has always had problems uh, for a long time now. They keep trying to revive it. Um, and this is a view. That's the big berm, the parking on the other side, looking back to the city. And this is our sloping path. Um, I swear I originally designed it as 5% slope, but we were out there and trying to measure it. <coughs> it was more like 2 to 3%. <laughs> Not sure what happened there. <laughs> so these are monumental kind of steps, seat walls stepping down, uh, creating this kind of amphitheater space. But I'm not sure how often this space was ever used. Maybe the seats, but not uh, down there. Whoops, sorry. What? Um, I'm not sure if this might be my final G uh, hard grace project. But anyways, I uh, also worked on uh, GM headquarters. Uh, <coughs> GM has a huge, huge campus in Warren, Michigan. Uh, everything came out of here. Uh, I believe all the GM brands from Lake Cadillac to, to Oldsmobile and whatever, all, all the GM stuff came out of here. And at the time, they wanted to develop a whole new, rethink the entire campus. So Hargreaves Associates were uh, hired to redo the master plan. There was a new building, a new kind of signature building by KMD uh, that were put up here. And then this used to be parking lot as well, but we uh, dug it up and created this uh, um, island, which became basically kind of the display area Every, whenever they have big events or new cars to showcase have a big kind of a uh, um, um, publicity event uh, it happens out here and this was obviously you can sort of tell we were trying to match the, the lake to the original lake and by the way these were all um, uh, aero serenade uh, work as well so I worked on that island uh, again some uh, CAD drawings um, um, and this was, you know, you can sort of tell, this is, um, I, still, I still have Kylie work in the back of my mind, fresh. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to propose this uh, growth of trees out here um, after working with George uh, meticulously <laughs> about this mound, this very uh, strange looking mound. And he liked the grove too, so uh, I was surprised and we stuck with that. And these, uh, this path, uh, again, as you can guess, 5% sloping path, so no handrails that come, wraps around, comes down. And there's this is a seat wall along this line where you know, a lot of utilities, power, and things can come out. So lots of events, lots of different kinds of events can happen out here. So unfortunately, I don't have any site photos, but this is what I can pull from Google Earth. So it's pretty cool. What's the grove of trees? What kind of trees are they? Honey locust. Mm. It's another Kylie homage. <laughs> so after uh, working at George's uh, office, I moved over to Pete Walker, uh, East Bay in Berkeley. And um, so completely different office, completely different way of thinking. Uh, Hargrave's office was all about, you know, just go, 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 or sink or swim, they just throw you to work and you just uh, survive if you can. And, um, and it's all a little bit chaotic, uh, to, to say the least. But once I got to Pete's office, you know, everything was very 
uh, much more regimented, organized, um, almost too much maybe, uh, because we were very kind of uh, departmentalized. Uh, the designers work with the designers, design principles, and then you have the kind of the, uh, the detail, the construction design uh, group sort of have their own group going, uh, but very, very efficient. So. Um, this is a project in the Southern California South Coast Repertory Theater. Uh, it's located somewhere in here. It's right there. And uh, South Coast uh, Shopping Mall is huge and, and also a, a little business park. And it's all owned by one developer, uh, Secrets from uh, Development. And I believe Noguchi's uh, California th is right here as well, very nearby. And if any Pete Walker fan in here, uh, this is the Caesar Pelly building is uh, entirely stainless steel. It's crazy, beautiful building. And when you get to the bottom of it, the, the landscape, this is the where kind of famous concentric ring stainless steel water feature. That's, that's where it's located. It's right here at the base of this building. So it's a simple, nice little project that I uh, got the chance to work on the design of it, and not so much <laughs> the CDs part. But you know, I kind of you know uh, stay in contact with the, the team and, and kind of checking on what they were doing. Apologize, the graphics a little hard to see here, but uh, this is the little kind of plaza uh, we developed. Very small project, really. Uh, th this is a theater. It used to be about this big and it expanded to here. And then so the, we came up with a new uh, plaza that extended and wraps this whole new frontage. The pattern was pretty cool. Um, it's a, uh, a harlequin uh, pattern, these diamond shapes. So it kind of referenced the theater aspect, you know, like traditional theater clowns. They just sort of wear this uh, costume that's like that. So. So we did that. That was kind of a key move, and then and then your kind of a quintessential PWP stainless steel bollard um, and, and the gray um, concrete. And some and they all came with these uh, lights that that's a very soft, uh, glowing light at night. So it's. It's quite nice. And we got a couple of uh, crepe murals uh, in here um, with a, a nice uh, circle tree grid. So it creates a nice uh, uh, resting space out here. I believe there are you know, theater. So whenever there's an event and then there's a break in the show, you know, people will come out and, and take over the space. And then we developed these things as well. We had this idea of you know, extending the stairs. The, these stairs uh, are, are, are mirrored uh, inside. In the interior space, there are stairs mm -hmm. right at this spot, too. So they feel like they're all coming out And as the uh, finished floor steps down. More crate model. Just admiring the tree grate here. And then this to the south end of the theater. And then, I don't know if you can see it or recognize it, but that's, uh, right, that's the that's parking garage that faces that stainless steel Susan Pelly building. So I believe, oh yeah, it's not here. It's, it's on the other side of the building. It's where that um, the concentric ring uh, water feature is, is. So it's just a half a block away. Um, so working at Pete's office, one of the um, uh, perks was that we got to do a lot of uh, international projects. We really got out there um, because of Pete's reputation. A lot of people wanted him to work on his projects. So there's this wonderful client that called us uh, uh, out, of, out of the blue one day. And out of the blue, um, James Lord picked up the phone. <laughs> and, and that's how this project started. It's, um, it's in Auckland, New Zealand, as you can see. It's a gigantic uh, business park. It's this entire thing. And that's Mount Wellington. If anyone's familiar with uh, Auckland, that's uh, very noticeable if you're around the city. I believe the downtown is probably up here somewhere. 
and all I got is a couple of plan graphics but you know I one thing I can definitely say about this project is definitely one of the first projects that I worked on that dealt with um, storm water management uh, in ways that you know it was really never thought about way back when in 2000. Uh, because I think uh, Australia and New Zealand, they have pretty strict laws about how to handle their uh, storm water going into the sea. And um, so all of the drainage that came, comes out of the development, they all empty into these areas, these wetlands that we created all along the coastline. So we use that, we, we leverage that infrastructure need to create um, this really nice green space. So there are lots of amenities about it. You can see paths, there, there's bike paths, walking paths, equestrian paths, uh, stopping points, all kinds of uh, nice stuff along here. And these circles are CDS units. I'm not gonna get into the technical details about that, but you know, that's where uh, the trash is collected from all the drainage that goes out. So that was all along the coast, and that was all done. Um, I'm not going to flip back to the, 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 the aerial folder now, but what, what was nice uh, for us um, was, again, we leveraged that uh, requirement, and, and basically all that infrastructure, which essentially really functioned as a park, was built first before any of the development. And uh, as you might see, that we had this kind of main street development that we, we proposed to doing, and they didn't do any of it. <laughs> so it, you saw those big boxes out here, uh, which I think to us uh, was fine. We don't really care because we, uh, well, I shouldn't say we don't care, but we spent a lot of time developing them. <laughs> but, but these were the big moves. These, all of these parks were all done. So that was really great. And you can see from the natural topography, this is a remnant of a volcano. This is kind of the top edge around it. Could you, could you go back to that? You do want me to go back. Is there that curve I mean, which goes along the top rim this? of the old volcano? Yes. Those are trees. Those are trees. And do they emanate from a, a radial point? On, of one of those uh, points, or I mean, was there a specific point? We were just tracing the, the, the ridge line. Really? And it was uh, that, that perfect of an arc? It's, it's not, to we drew it perfect arc, but the, the, of course the natural ridge line is not, you know, you uh -huh. can see it's the, the, the high point is probably a little bit bowing out yeah. over here. But, uh, but we made it this way, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, I think you can, well, let's just go back. See, you, it's, it was done. Maybe not quite at the scale that we wanted. Uh, that looks like single or double row, but we have like quadruple rows going on in here. It's like a major boulevard. So some um, money shots. Uh, there's a great uh, illustrator, Chris Grubbs, uh, that's done a lot of work for, for different um, uh, offices here in the Bay Area. So Chris did all, all these drawings. And the main row, and, and how those hedgerows kind of cut across. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot to mention all these hedgerows, all these perpendicular lines. They all are oriented to direct your view to Mount Wellington. So it's kind of a, a, a reference point for uh, where you are in Auckland. So that's <laughs> slightly exaggerated, but that that was the uh, intended outcome. And then, of course, you got people on horses and all that. And these are all hand renderings. Yeah, Chris. Chris Grubbs. Grubbsy. Mm -hmm. uh, another major international um, job. Uh, we did a lot of work in Europe. Um, and this is one of the projects that I worked on um, for the Novartis uh, headquarters in Basel, Switzerland. Um, it was a major uh, campus um, plan that had a lot of different players. I'm not, I, I can't even recite all the names. Um, but there is some, it's kind of like your who's who architectural 
uh, giants as well, uh, beginning with Frank Gehry in, in the middle that I can recognize, and a couple of different uh, European architects. Whoops, there we go. And these are hard to see graphics. I apologize. But I really just worked on the master planning part of the project. And um, I'm going to try to back up one slide here. There we go. Yeah, you can't really see it. Um, but we're, um, oh boy, we're developing phasing uh, um, for, for the plan and, and to see how it will all come together. But interestingly enough, we, we got some uh, uh, international borders to deal with, too. Uh, up here, that's France. Uh, so there's a parking lot that people working for Novartis uh, uses, and they're on the French side. So they cross the border here pretty much every day <laughs> to get into this side to, to go to work. And there's a very, very nice little project, a crossing a project. You will find that on uh, Pete's website. Uh, it's very, very well done with a Richard Serra art piece in there. And um, that's where that is. That's what that's about. And then this plan just shows all the infrastructure, the underground spaghetti mess, and the utilities that are on the campus that we're trying to grapple with. So now I'm just going to click quickly. I got a couple of other plans, other projects I worked on. Uh, while at Pete's, uh, this is with Daniel Lipskin for the Denver Art Museum. Uh, that was his proposed building and, and our landscape uh, uh, scheme is pretty busy and, uh, and unfortunately this is uh, not the picked scheme. <laughs> and also another one with uh, Lipskin as well and this is, a, this is actually a shopping center. Uh, it's kind of weird, uh, the building doing uh, very strange things, so we had this really wild plan to go with it. Um, I don't think that went through either, but uh, it is a very interesting site because uh, this is a o sitting over top of an entrance to a tunnel. This is the freeway. This is the, the, what do you call it, what's that major highway in Europe that you can drive at any speed? Uh, the Autobahn. Autobahn. Uh -huh. That's, that's the Aubon coming through and basically get tunnelized uh, and, and kind of go around uh, Bern. Bern's a very, very old uh, um, town in Switzerland, and um, the, that, that entrance that goes through the tunnel and just kind of blasts you around um, Bern and bypass the city. So after this point, I moved um, uh, to a firm Edal, and unfortunately, that name probably do not ring a bell for you. Um, but it's a multidiscipline firm started by Gary Ekbo, uh, Ekbo, Dean Austin Williams. And we did uh, a lot of different things from planning to design to environmental design, a lot of that stuff. And, and we we're pretty big on our own. Uh, we did a lot of um, international projects. So while I was there, you know, I, uh, this is at the point in my career where you know, becoming more senior, I'm leading uh, design projects to be the kind of senior designer and, and project manager. And um, so the next couple of projects are the projects that uh, I worked on. Um, so this is my thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm always uh, very interested in the integration of architecture and landscape. I like to see the, the the stew that, that comes together and that, you know, I'm, I'm never advocate for, you know, uh, a separation of the two, you know, that, that architecture ought to stand on its own and, and a beautiful park is a beautiful park. You know, it ought to be a space for me. It's, it's all the same thing whether you're on structure or not or you're in the building or you're not. You know, I'm always uh, looking for the design intent of a project and, and um, and how do you really um, uh, encapsulate that and, and, and um, express that you know, big idea that, that pulls it all together? Right, so these next couple of images is basically what I talked about. Uh, and just referencing some of the uh, key images that, that kind of uh, talk about my background.
so there, I, for some reason, uh, by chance, I worked on a lot of hospital projects in the Bay Area. Uh, this is one that was finally completed uh, construction, uh, oh, was it last year or two years ago? A around two years. Last year, I would say, is officially uh, done um, for the uh, Southern Health Alta Bates Summit. It's in Oakland. Uh, it's a new uh, uh, patient tower uh, just gone up there. It's very nice, very snazzy, almost hotel-like, and uh, centrally located new parking garage. Uh, this is one of those projects where you know, we're called in to, to do something pretty simple, uh, which was to analyze the space, this awful space that they came up with, which was between the two garages. There's 20 feet. Uh, in between there, that's the existing garage and the proposed new garage. And they asked us, well, what can you do with that? Instead of saying not much, <laughs> which was on the tip of my tongue, um, we said, well, uh, let's look at this. And um, we came up with options and ideas, but of course we tried to expand our scope because we told them, well, you really ought to look at you know, what else is happening, how everything is connected, how the campus is working or not working in this case. Um, so it was all about connecting the dots. You know, we knew students were, it's a teaching hospital, so there, there is classrooms down here and a hospital up here. Um, people are making all these different uh, connections and routes. So we thought, you know, we really have to think about those spaces and create a, a, a livable, a enjoyable campus for all these users. To, to use. So um, to our delight, they agreed and we were signed up to do a um, complete uh, campus master plan. And then we really dove uh, deeply into you know, hospitals. When you think about it, there's tons of circulation issues. There's all kinds of different users. There's emergency, there's patients, there's families, there's you know, the patient that's frantic who's probably lost a finger and trying to drive to ED, or there's the you know, family of a patient who sometimes could be frantic as well. So they all need to know where they're going. So we did our best to trace all the different scenarios and routes and, you know, where they come from, where they're going, and how to create, uh, how to just make sense of it all. So tons of analysis work. Uh, we eventually got to a point, you can see pedestrian court, we got to a point where, you know, we said, boy, this is really a great space. We really need to make something out of this. So we you know, identified a great potential and then we really pushed the idea because, you know, we knew this was the right thing to do. We really knew that you need the heart of a campus, you know, a, a space that everyone can come to uh, uh, to enjoy because, you know, at that point, uh, th there's really nothing. So they surprisingly uh, agreed. Uh, this was our plan, and uh, it was basically uh, a way of bringing people, because there's a, s a subway stop down here, this is Hawthorne, it's a very steep uh, hill here, there's a way of uh, uh, bringing uh, people in, going through the garage, using the elevator, come up a couple of levels, and then coming along here across the street, and to go up this ramp, so it is ADA accessible from bus stop right to patient tower to a hospital. And then meanwhile, we got our space. And here's a couple of pictures yeah. of it. So we create this kind of big uh, seat walls that you know, people can sit on and use. Uh, all native grasses, low water, uh, deer grass, redwoods. And that's the new hospital, just completed. I believe these pictures were literally on opening day last year, summer, sometime. So that was the existing garage, and behind it was a big, big new proposed garage. So it's out there, it's all publicly accessible, Alta Base Summit. So this is uh, a, let's wait for the screen to come back. And a nice kind of elevation view. Uh, this this really sloping as as we created these uh, um, seat walls along that walk. So patients, staff, public, anyone can come out and use that space. 
And in fact, the, the, the building is actually quite cool inside too. And we got this image from uh, looking out from their, I think, physical therapy, kind of like a gym looking out and you see this. Other spaces, connections. So that's 20 feet between garage. <laughs> so we did the best we could in uh, putting in planters and planting. Uh, there were other things that we proposed, but you no, know, it was out of budget range. But that's okay. We had the campus to work on. And this is a stormwater treatment for the entire parking garage. All the stormwater comes out here and is treated here before it flows out. So this is a view down to the, the plaza garden from the existing garage top level. And here's a night view. And we also, there's another entrance from Telegraph. And this was a big uh, issue for the city because this garage, as you can tell, is pretty big, uh, looking at it from Telegraph. So, well, the classic problem, what do you do with a big building? You ask the landscape architect to block it. <laughs> so I said, OK. <laughs> well, we developed this uh, space, this kind of traffic island, because there was a lot of traffic concerns uh, that, that might queue up back into, back into Telegraph. So these were all you know, uh, issues that came from review with the city. Um, so even though I'm sure Sutter would have wanted us to put parking spaces out here so they can park more cars, instead we had you know, this almost kind of a VIP driveway into the garage. And we had this giant island which we planted redwoods, which uh, is looking pretty good today. It's practically blocking the entire garage. Uh, Kaiser Hospital, another major hospital in San Leandro, that's 880. Um, and it's complete today. Uh, this is a tough project to deal with because of uh, Kaiser has very strict rules and regulations, policies. Uh, the hospital is a template hospital. Uh, that's a scary word for most architects, but it just means that you're not designing much. Um, the only thing you are designing is this building off to the edge, so you can see the different versions. They're all a little bit different. That's the hospital support building, which is basically your medical office building. And that's the part that's not template, but the, uh, the patient tower is all template. It's all the same. And we're looking at the campus. We originally will work on the entire 60-acre uh, site, but you know, cut dwindled down. There was another um, a commerce a commercial uh, developer that was going to do a shopping mall. We we're going to connect the two areas, very different users, but at the same time, that's what they wanted. And it didn't ever quite work out that way. They dropped out, and Kaiser uh, decided to, OK, let's, let's just forget them. We're going to work on our half, and this is the proposed plan. Because they did not have the budget to build a garage, uh, in the phase one, we had to make sure we park on site, which is um, not that great of an idea. But we dealt with it. We, we, we put our thinking caps on and develop a scheme where it is um, you can phase in future buildings so that the, you can see some major corridors, like something like this, a walkway with trees on it. And all of these are, fa are planned to remain. Uh, they, uh, they won't ever uh, need to uh, remove that because that space from that tree corridor to this is enough of a depth for them to build future buildings uh, such as a, another MOB or garage which we had planned for this space. A garage would come here if they, if they ever decide to expand the building or, or build more uh, office buildings out here in the lot, then they can build a garage in this corner. And that's partly why this driveway does this little funny job, because uh, it, it, there was not enough service parking. So we actually had to create more service parking by pushing this uh, uh, <coughs> ring row out. And what we did, what we played with, is essentially the spaces that surrounded the um, HSB, the hospital support building. Um, and we came up with a scheme where we you know, want to bring nature uh, to the site. And we developed this idea of creating uh, these landforms that are shaped like landforms and, and uh, different paving patterns. 
that created the sticks. So that's what these landforms were shaped like in plan. And that begins to carve the different spaces, entryway to the main, main hospital, and the paths, these were kind of the little sticks on the ground that you saw on the plants. So they're like sticks and leaves uh, that's just kind of falling onto the site. The curving seat walls trying to break up the monotony of the uh, flat stucco wall of the building. And the, the leaf shaped landforms. Labyrinths. Hospitals like labyrinths a lot. And then this is in the template hospital, so you guessed it is a template courtyard. So some of the rules we have to stick with is the planters have to be round and they have to be planted with bamboo. Everything else was relatively free. So anyway, strange rules, but we had to deal with it. And a lot of uh, stormwater treatment, you know. You had so much surface parking, we just you know, had to deal with it. And we also made uh, different uh, paths. This is on the east side. We had a curving paths. And then towards the west side, which faces the city, more urban. So we uh, did something more uh, rectilinear just to kind of uh, play with the different parking lot designs. We even have um, custom bus stops and exercise stations. So we packed in there what we can. Uh, I think this is my uh, final hospital uh, project, uh, LPCH, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, down in Stanford. This is the adult uh, Stanford Hospital, and this, is, this little corner is the LPCH Children's Hospital, and the expansion project is moving out to here. Um, this is a Google view, but today the building is uh, pretty much topped out. Um, but there's still lots of work to do. I believe they're opening officially 2017. Um, Stanford, so we are, this is the uh, Stanford uh, Arboretum out here, uh, this group of trees. And this is Stanford Mall up to the north. So this is a drawing plan. So that's the existing building here and, and our expansion project out here. We had what you can call really a dream client uh, for us. Uh, they, the Packer Foundation really wanted a, um, uh, a sustainable uh, architecture and landscape approach to, to this uh, hospital. And uh, so we, uh, right from the onset, um, this diagram essentially uh, what the architects uh, wanted to do was to, they, they wanted to replicate the gardens that are in the existing um, hospital to come out and step out and onto the landscape. Uh, what we came up with was to find a way of bringing landscape right into the building, through it and out the other side. <laughs> so it's really a complete uh, merging of the two. And never underestimate the power of hand sketches and idea creations. Uh, these were done like in a minute or less while I was uh, working with the design architects in New York and, and to the end you know, th these were very helpful to get our ideas uh, worked out. Um, the architects originally talked about just creating a big mound to help them. Again, this is a funny story. They, they wanted us to, because they knew the hospital was going to be pretty big vertically, so they wanted the landscape to hide the building. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's always a little strange when you hear that. Um, but we came up with this idea of less, you know, less, instead of just creating a very architectural uh, a rectilinear mound, which is what they were showing, uh, let's come up with an idea. And then we talked about uh, bringing nature, and then we talked about how, hey, let's look at this building as kind of a metaphor for a tree. And because they were going to go that way with their interior design anyway, so if different levels is going to represent different um, strata of, uh, of uh, the height of a tree, like, you know, from foliage to the to, to trunk. So what I was working on, the idea of is the roots that were going to grow out of the building. And, and you know how roots grow out and begin to bifurcate and separate and reach out into the landscape. 
So that was essentially the kind of underlying concept behind that. And then we have another garden uh, that's on top of the roof, and that's what we call the, the kind of children's uh, discovery garden. Uh, it's entirely roof garden on top of the surgery floor, believe it or not. So this was the plan. We had these uh, stone walls out here that begins to build up a mound that, that is bifurcated and it comes together as one big wall that, that runs along the entrance and goes into the building and then eventually comes out and then separates and then it does all sorts of different things. It creates the amphitheater, it creates uh, a, a path that, that comes out and wraps around. This is a path that gets you up for kids in wheelchair or gurneys that they can go, get up high to see what's going on down here in the event space. Uh, again, all 5% sloping path. Um, in this, what we call the Emerald Garden, there was a lot of different fun activities planned. Uh, there'll be outdoor uh, movies and theater and visiting clowns and all that. So that's the great lawn out here. And there they are, lots of fun. <laughs> so the glass facade is the building. So behind this is an interior space, but this stone wall slips behind that glass and goes inside into the building. So it, once it comes out, and then the different levels start to peel apart and then creates like a little amphitheater here like that. And then we spend a lot of time talking about this space. There are you know, originally, <laughs> there are a lot of existing uh, redwoods out at this uh, street corner. Um, uh, for reasons, just, just a too long a story to tell now. Um, the trees we were trying to save was eventually still had to be pulled out of the ground, boxed, moved. And right now, it's being tended uh, somewhere in the arboretum, I think. It's just sitting there. Uh, eventually, they would be moved back. But, um, but our original concept was, to, by doing this, was that we would be able to save all these uh, redwoods uh, and, and the big oak right here uh, to save them and keep them where they are. So that was a bit of a wasted effort. But it's still a good um, idea to move forward with because this is kind of the institutions give back to community because it's all public land. So it's like a mini public park at the street corner. You have the big kind of a stone wall, a haha -ha wall, in fact. Uh, does everybody know what a ha haha wall is? OK, thank goodness. So I'm not going to explain that. Um, and, to, and so people inside can look out onto the, uh, the, the rest of the campus. Meanwhile, you know, the, the site drops a little bit lower from that path. And uh, this is all publicly accessible. Again, back to the Discovery Garden. Uh, this is entirely a roof garden on top of surgery floor. These are skylights to a cor corridor that's underneath. Uh, so the um, coordination uh, of this was quite uh, challenging. Um, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> And here's some the most current photos I could find. Uh, that the, the all the little things are being that the concrete walls are uh, about to be poured. I think they are poured now today. Um, but these are the skylights that, that can look below. So you can see how this is the corner. Uh, so this is going to be the big uh, event space out here. Eventually, the mound will come out and wrap around, do all that. And again, to for so that's the existing LPCH and, the, and then the existing adult hospital back there, Stanford Barn. So is AECON working on this now? Yep. They are the landscape architects on record for it. So besides the hospitals, uh, I also worked a lot on the Mission Bay projects while I was at EDAL. Um, let me just kind of try to fly through this. So working in the public realm is a whole another challenge in you know, of itself. Um, I uh, met a lot of people uh, through many, many nights of uh, CAC meetings. Um, meet the community, you hear their stories, uh, some of it helpful, some of it not quite. Um, but it's always a, a challenge to, to, to do the, all that effort. But at the end of the day, it, it does uh, 
it is worth it because you you know that you are designing something that is for a specific user. It's not just uh, just for somebody's brand or somebody's uh, front door. It, you know, it's actually going to the um, benefit of somebody's lives. So I really enjoy working on this. Uh, this is the second phase of our original e doll Mission Creek Park. Uh, the house boaters uh, are all living here. And this is in construction right now. I think uh, I worked on this design part, up to schematic design, while I believe WRT picked up the project and uh, have done the final design, which I'm not sure what it looks like, but yeah. hopefully it's something close to this. But as you can imagine, these guys were very vocal. Uh, and we had many, many meetings with them to come up with an approach that worked because there's so many stakeholders. There, of course, there's the residents, but then again, they don't own the land they're on. They don't even own the water they're on. So, but they're vocal. <laughs> so, so it's a very uh, interesting uh, stew of uh, political mess that we had to uh, navigate. Uh, playing with the graphics, uh, you can see uh, that the area folder is showing what is uh, to remain because they, the, house the house builders worked on their little park and they saw it as their park. Mm -hmm. So they want to maintain control while we did this uh, design out here, uh, separated by a bike path, type 1 bike path. and some quick uh, SketchUp uh, model images of what that park is going to feel like. We also work on the commons. The commons is the one linear park that divides the, all the housing and residential from UCSF. UCSF is right here. Um, this is fourth. This is third. Um, and this is uh, P15, which is kind of the central piece, because there are two more blocks that goes east, which was uh, done by Cliff Lowe. And, and he's done a very nice job, and they're all built. But these ones are not built, not yet. Um, so stay tuned. So all these uh, designs, uh, imagery, were all vetted, reviewed. Everyone uh, approved uh, SFRA when they were still around, <laughs> uh, approved uh, all of this stuff back in, gosh, probably 2005, and it's been on the shelf. And yeah, so after working uh, at AECOM, I uh, went back to work for Pete uh, uh, one more time. And I worked on this really interesting project. I had to fly to Singapore a couple of times, I believe literally three times in two months. Um, and it was a quick paced project, but it's a residential for this developer uh, Keppel um, land. And uh, it's the only privately owned uh, island uh, along the waterfront of Singapore. Um, uh, a note to make, uh, just check out in um, in this view, these are, I believe, at that time, the first and only residential towers by Daniel Lipskin. And they're really, really cool. So we had the opportunity to go in and we kind of got a nice little tour around these buildings and checked out, checked it out. Uh, landscape by Hargraves Associates. So Pete, uh, Pete's firm, PWP, we were uh, invited to, to work on this with uh, Moshe Safdie a long-term uh, friend of Pete's. So Softy Associates, they, they developed this uh, plan where you know, there's these circular shaped uh, buildings and, and they're kind of like sea urchin looking when you see it in a 3D form. And uh, so we play with that idea. So we basically developed this uh, sense of, you know, what if we create these uh, kind of circular gardens and just had these paths of meandering uh, things that, that kind of take you through this public park and ar around the uh, waterfront and around the residential. Um, and, and in Singapore, uh, what's amazing about Singapore is uh, everyone told us anything grows. So you better be sure what you want <laughs> to grow <laughs> because it is 
is so um, uh, ripe for 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 plantings that you know this tropical. We are definitely in a tropical environment here. Um, we uh, we just kind of ran the gamut. We we went for um, uh, aquatic um, lowly gardens uh, to to all sorts of other crazy ideas out here. And these were, you know, easier than you think uh, to create, uh, el un unless you don't think these are great. But uh, we thought they, they turned out pretty well. But uh, it, it was uh, a photo montage from a uh, SketchUp a base uh, 3D drawing with uh, all these different materials kind of laid on top with obviously an existing a site photo uh, set up for the view. So these were all basically Photoshop together. So that's my little sea urchin thing up there. It's kind of funky. So the project was very well received. Um, unfortunately, it never got uh, to move ahead because uh, of just local politics, I think. Uh, um, Partly because I believe that developer were uh, cheating a little bit in terms of uh, what was private land and what was public. Uh, you can see, you can even see it in this 3D view. This driveway that sets up the property line. So you can see this driveway it uh, dies into this building. So everything that's on this side is actually public. So they're developing their own building out here, but they were banging on the. Uh, betting on on the uh, scenario where they can uh, they will offer to to build and maintain this lovely uh, public park designed by Pete Walker uh, in order for them to to squeeze out a little bit more developable land for themselves. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't work out. So after that, I I uh, started my own little practice. Uh, worked on some res residential projects. Um, this one uh, got built. Uh, I was playing with the idea of creating this kind of uh, um, forced perspective. Uh, it's a very small little uh, patio garden space, um, and I wanted to make the f space feel you know, larger than it is. So I played with these uh, angles and lines um, to try to get that a larger uh, site feel uh, horse tails in the planter and uh, well of course the photography helps <laughs> when you shoot it the way you shoot it um, but anyway a couple of evening shots and, and some lighting making a big difference and then one more project I'm working on right now for a local school. Uh, it's uh, we're in Pacifica, uh, and this is um, the school is located right here. It's a small, small little project, but now I'm having fun with it. Uh, just talking about uh, relating to the ocean, the ocean waves. The school wanted a uh, space to to basically you know do something about the front because there's really nothing there. Uh, besides a couple of big rocks and the kids kind of jump on it and run around, it's kind of dangerous. And they just never really have a, a meeting space uh, for, you know, whenever they go on big field trips, you know, there's no place for everyone to go. So that's what we're talking about creating and I came up with this uh, wave bench uh, concept of basically creating all these kind of low benches in different uh, heights and lengths kind of mimicking the waterways. What are the vertical elements? That's actually a post uh, for there's a shade structure that kind of runs along. I just didn't bother to model the rest of it. Yeah. So that is uh, still in the works. Hopefully uh, it will get done sometime this year or next year. We're, we're just uh, pulling fundings together. And that's where I am today.